My name is Gina Zapinski. Okay. I just wanted to mention some of the Indian education programs that have been involved in this. In the beginning, when Indian education was big, there was always Port Huron, Algonac, Anchor Bay, uh, Warren Consolidated, Clintondale, Detroit Indian Education. You used to have Way Out in Waterford and Clarkston and Highland. I think it was Highland something, I can't remember them, but there used to be quite a few Indian education programs uh, back in the day when uh, that was, you know, Indian education was big and going back, started back in the early, at the late 70s and still has continued on today. So the history of the Algonac powwow actually started more than 30 years ago. It started out at first with the Blue Water it was a consortium of different Indian agencies and Indian education programs. Then uh, that kind of fell to the side and some of the group members became what is now known as American Indian Communities Leadership Council. And it was started to have uh, a lot of the children that were in the Indian education programs had never been to a powwow. Their parents had probably never been to a powwow. Because Indian education basically was started so that the children could learn their native culture and this goes back to the fact that you know their parents and great-grandparents uh, were not allowed to partake in those types of traditions so they didn't even know about them so we are that's what the Indian education program started out as teaching that culture and those traditions and so the powwow was one of the ways that we wanted to get the children involved so each Indian education program would have their their, their students make uh, regalia and we started out by having a, a drum come in at Algonac, and it would be just a couple hours. So it just progressed year after year into being what it is today, which still is a, about a four hour program. And it's still geared towards children, but we bring in a lot of other uh, people, especially from Wapu Island, like our drummers come from there, the White Eye Singers, and they always bring their family members and other people from that community come in. And uh, it, we used to have a parade, that kind of, I don't know whatever happened to that, but it used to be pretty well attended. And so now, and then one year we even had a, uh, a skateboarding competition. And so that's pretty much the history of the Algonac Powell. I think so historically, uh, I know, like for from from powwows, it kind of evolved after after Native Americans or Anishinaabe. We were, I think it was 1978. We heard the, the Freedom of Religion Act, so it started becoming more prevalent now in the open. Whereas prior to that, we weren't allowed to have our ceremonies or practice, speak the language. Out west, 
We borrowed the ways from uh, Western tribes, from the Plains areas. My sister made uh, made my outfit. Took her about, I think about two weeks. Two weeks and five pots of coffee. My name <laughs> is Tim Seneca. And as you can see, we are all gathered here today at the powwow. Powwow to me is important because it gives us an opportunity to get out there and to uh, share our culture, our dance, uh, what our, our, our ancestors did, and we do it today to honor, but also honor like family for our family members, our ones who've gone on, and we also honor the, uh, the creator who shines down on all of us. Um, I started jingle dress dancing. It's a medicine dress. Mushkiki um, Bashko Day. It's a medicine dress. So. I think specifically from, from my culture and that I'm Ojibwe, this this dress goes back historically to um, like well, it's a it's a healing dress. So when people pass me one of those four sacred medicines, that tobacco, that what I'm doing when I'm dancing at a powwow um, is I'm praying for, for people that are suffering with an illness or um, maybe a family member of theirs that on their behalf they're passing tobacco to me so that's that's what I'm doing out there with this uh, medicine dress it's praying for people that are suffering and um, so back in the day the Meweja they but these dresses used to be have um, like deer deer hooves on them and then so moving into like contemporary times it evolved into the, like, the snuff can lids and and so each cone was made with a prayer. So um, this dress is full of prayers. And um, I don't dance contest powwows. I only just, that's just my choice. I just dance traditional powwows. And um, so for me, it, it helps me keep things in perspective and, and walk on, on the red road. What we do, the grass dancers would do back in the day, they would go out and they would secure the dance arena. Their job was to go out and if you have noticed, I was doing all the all the stomps and all the patting. Is the grass dancers would go out and they would secure the dance arena and get it ready for all the dancers. So they, their job was to go out and they would they would search for stones, sharp objects, you know, sticks and all that. And you know they see them do the sweep and everything and you know patting the grass down, looking for even even holes because you know some people could dance and they could fall in the hole and they could sprain or something. In the Nishinaabe world. Uh, Men and women, they had different roles in the community. They were responsible for different things. And um, for instance, if you watch a grand entry, the men go in first, and then the women go in last. And uh, if you were to view that from a Western point of view, an American point of view, um, that might make some women mad. Like, oh, why do women got to go in second? The women go in behind the men so that they can show the men where to go tell them where to go. And so it's not a disrespectful thing, disrespectful thing if uh, you look at it that way. If you go to a powwow, you'll see that uh, most tribes don't allow women to sit at the drum. It's only men. And women stand behind the men and sing behind them. And that's not men out of disrespect. That's because uh, our women, uh, our old ones tell us that our women are powerful. They're real powerful and strong. Their spirits are stronger than men's. And uh, if they were to sit at the drum, uh, it would disrupt, it would unbalance the harmony of the spirits that come around that drum. Because the women have power to give life and they carry us for nine months, and all the things that they do for our family and our nations, that's why they're so powerful and their spirits are so powerful. Historically, I think that that's, that's where these powwows come from. It's, it's like a celebration. And sometimes we can catch up with people that we haven't seen in a long time. And um, so when we're out there, we're dancing, we're having a good time, we're celebrating. And, um, and a lot of different ceremonies could be happening too at powwows, and they're all different. But, but none of them are the same. So within a powwow, there could be like maybe someone's getting their name or um, someone's
someone is feasting their regalia, or I mean, it could, could go on and on. There's so many different parts to a powwow, and they're all different. That's the beautiful thing. So um, I think they're becoming more and more alive. The more that people become aware of their culture, and, um, so that's uh, that's what I know about powwows. <laughs> And then you can, you know, do whatever your heart tells you to do. There's no wrong answers. The fancy shawl dance is also known as the butterfly dance um, because when we start off in the fancy shawl dance, we start off with the shawl wrapped around us like a cocoon. And then when we start to dance, we emerge from the cocoon and spread our wings like a butterfly. So a lot of times you'll hear it also called the butterfly dance. It's good to come out and hang out in the and have a good time, man. Also, you can also learn. If you're not a dancer, now's the time to come out and take some dance lessons and get out there and dance with us. Be part of the circle. So, I want to see you at a powwow soon. Thank you.